some people might very well ask, well, why the hell do you want to write these long story songs? You know, I, I uh, gave one of my earlier recordings to a co-worker at work, and she said, you have that one song on it. It just came one on with the same melody over and over and over and over again. Well, that's what I like about all Precisely. these songs. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and the answer is because that's what I like to listen to. And interestingly enough, although Phil's traditional stuff certainly has been a big influence on me, um, some of the earlier um, contemporary writers that were a big influence, I'd say out of all of them, probably the biggest one was Harry Chapin. Because I love myself to listen to a song and to be able to create my own pictures from the words that that person is using. And. Uh, Certainly, I don't write all story ballads, and, uh, but a uh, good portion of them are, since Phil talked about this one in our set last night, we'll do this one. It got started when I was listening to Richard Thompson's 1952 Vincent Black Lightning on my way up to the Upper Peninsula back in the late 90s. Now that is a, a ballad. It's, it's more of an up-tempo beat, but the story and the way it's constructed is very traditional. And I crossed over the border into the Upper Peninsula, and it was time to be in the place and the time. And the story started to come to me, and at first I thought it was a contemporary story, that it was happening in, in the 20th century, late 20th century America. But as I got more and more pictures, I realized, no, it's actually set in Chicago in the 1920s. And for those of you who are not familiar with a lot of the landmarks in Chicago, uh, Graceland is not the place where Elvis allegedly <laughs> lies buried. He's actually a vampire in the world. That's another, that's another, another song. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's our uh, big cemetery down by the lakefront many of Chicago's dignitaries lie in peace or not, as the case may be. <laughs> and uh, the uptown neighborhood where the song takes place went from a very uh, upscale neighborhood to a slum to a mega rich people's neighborhood, and it was always famous for its graystone mansions. So this is called Anna and Tim. This is another thing I don't always share with regular audiences, but what there's, Dave Carter used to say, all the stories are true. We even have a whole entire Unitarian service with that title, Do All Story Songs. And this one, I, I feel out of all of the story songs that I've written, I, these people have got to have lived in some form. And I found out in some cases that some of the stuff has come very close to Central reality. It's not a bad one. <laughs> <laughs> the Grey Stone was a show place with treasures rich and fine. Miss Anna was its owner back in 1929. She told him, come lay down, and afterwards he gazed into her eyes of amber brown. You know, this was my first time, gosh, I hope I did okay. You come on back tomorrow, boy, that was all that she could say. She had to say. She told him, I remember that when I was young and green, I had to make it on my own since I was just fourteen. 
way, this is a. Uh, oh, Susan, this is really a, getting tuned. This is a child ballad about uh, shape shifting. Uh, the great silkies. Silkies are seals. They turn into people. In some cases, they are given the gift of prophecy because this is a Scottish version. It's not good. <laughs> this is a Scottish version. It comes true. It must. Um, there's a lot of seal legends, and the, they don't come out uh, basically when humans interact with seals. Uh, in some cases, a man finds a seal skin on the beach and marries the seal woman, and she eventually will always wind up finding her uh, seal skin and going back to the sea, and he's lonely and the kids are desolate. But then there's a seal looking in on the kids once in a while to see if they're all right. I think that's because one of the theories was that seals, if you look at them in, in the eyes, actually look very human. It didn't stop the seal trade from slaughtering millions of seals in the North Seas. wanting to keep the woman would hide her seal skin. And of course, she she'd would start wasting away. She wanted to go back to the sea. In this case, the, uh, the seal is actually a man. And, uh, mates with a uh, well, woman. They have a baby. Never, never date outside your own species. Ballads <laughs> 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 are a lot like uh, audio movies, basically. You have to listen to each verse like the bit of a movie or chapter of a book. And in this case, you need to know uh, a Lily Wayne. A Lily Wayne is a baby. Scott's term for baby. After the fourth verse, seven years pass by. So when he comes to pay the nurse's fee, he is picking up a seven-year-old for a better apprenticeship, not an infant. Kind of like the fade to black. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you also wonder what relevance the ballads have now. And of course, at the end, where the you know she marries a gunner who apps, you know, accidentally or on purpose, the first seal he kills are her and the son. Well, how many stories do you hear about some baby getting beat up by the girlfriend's new, new boyfriend? I mean, that all this stuff, the ballads still ring with a lot of this stuff. And I'm not using the tune that Judy Collins or Joan Baez used. It was at the Godrich Celtic Roots Festival heard Archie Fisher use this tune. And which is a tune to Willie's Fatal Visit, which is another great ballad, but I don't know it yet. <laughs>
Likewise, the silly of silver. 